about obey and honor today. Obey and honor. Okay? 1 Samuel chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day, and would let him go no more home to his father's house. So in dealing with obedience and honor, what I'm going to talk about is specifically in the context of children to their parents, and then grown children, young adults, to their parents, okay? There's a time in the life of every child where they grow up to the point where obedience to their parents kind of makes this switch, and they begin to enter into the honor stage of their life, okay? So children, obey your parents, and the Bible continues and says, honor them afterwards, okay? So I just want to talk a little bit about that, because I saw some confusion in some groups that I run with, that... Um, online and such, and uh, the idea about whether or not we need to honor certain parents because of what they have done, or who they are, or, or what they believe, and not, and when we can obey, and when we shouldn't obey. So I like to go to David, okay, because David is this, this type of, of a just super obedient and humble servant of the Lord. He had the heartbeat of God. He was literally, he was literally said of him that he, he, he is a man after mine own heart, God said, okay? So when you look at David and his example and how he served under his father-in-law, we get to see a lot of things that we can learn and we can reflect on our own self. I often go to David, and I don't go to David because I think I am David. I go to David because I think I should try to be more like David, because he is a great example, especially in the early years of his life, of a godly man after God's own heart. And he messed up later, but he remained true to the heartbeat that was toward God and seeking after God, and his psalms just resonate with that. So we see there in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1 and 2, um, that Saul is, is taking uh, David into his own house. So much so that he says, don't go anymore into your own father's house. So what had happened was uh, Saul was, was the king, and Samuel had anointed David to be the king, but it remained that Saul was there for a time, and at the time, David stepped in and the great story of Goliath happened. And Saul began to notice this man as a great leader and as a great warrior and as a great musician. And he wanted him as one of his own, okay? So he brought him in. And at this time, the Bible says that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. And Jonathan is Saul's son. And their hearts, the Bible says, were knit together. So what you have here is a family, okay? David at this time is being adopted into the family. Hey, don't go to your father's house. You come to this house. And now these brothers have knit themselves together, and they're proceeding in the family relationship. Yeah, they're not blood, but we can still learn what blood family relationships and ties ought to look like. He says, go no more into thy home. That's when the adoption was made. Down in verse 5, it says, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him. Okay, So he's being obedient to Saul at this time. Wherever Saul, wherever his father, his father sent him, that's where David went. And it says, And behaved himself wisely, and Saul sent him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So whenever Saul sent David, that's where he went. And this, as he went... He behaved himself wisely, the Bible says. It records that David was very wise in how he dealt with each one of these scenarios. And it got him great approval and acceptance with the, the people that he was leading and with the people that were in around and taking notice and taking watch of these things. This is the first time within this chapter that it says David behaved himself wisely. Continue in verse 6 and it says, And it came to pass as they came... When David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one to another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth. The saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more 
but for the kingdom. And Saul eyed David from that day forward. So the relationship takes a turn here, obviously. Saul sees that after David slays Goliath, the great giant, that the women, the people, were singing of his praises and shouting, David has slain 10,000, and saw his thousands, yes, and he takes great offense to this. Instead of seeing that his son succeeded, he was rejoicing in the chapter earlier, instead of seeing it and, and being happy that his son was behaving wisely and having good favor and was, was setting himself up to be a great leader, Saul became jealous. Saul became envious of this. The Bible says he eyed David from that day forward. He had, he had an eye towards him. He was looking at him in a different fashion. The Bible records that David did whatever Saul wanted, but he, did, he got the praise of himself. In other words, the praise bypassed. Saul gave the command, and he expected that when it was done, he should have been praised for it. But that never happened, and so he eyed him from that day forward. Down in verse 10 it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Here the Bible is indicating that Saul's Rage and jealousy was such that an evil spirit came upon him. And when David showed up to try to soothe his conscience, to try to make him feel better in regard to this evil spirit that was upon him, Saul was just full of so much rage that he grabbed the javelin that was next to him and thrust it at David, trying to kill him, trying to spear him to the very wall. He was so upset with his son. Now remember, we're talking here about a father and a son relationship. We've got to keep this all in the context as we walk through it. Verse 12 continues, And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him captive over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways. And the Lord was with him. And so great fear here comes upon Saul because the Lord is with him. There's no other reason than that given. David, yes, got the praise for it, but did not David, before he slung that sling, before that throat, that, that stone left and wedged itself in the forehead of Goliath, did not David say, the Lord shall guide these things, the Lord is my shepherd, give praise unto the Lord, who am I? But look at the Lord, I come in the name of the Lord, is what David said. But here Saul is greatly afraid of him because he thinks that there's something that David is doing in and of itself. Instead of giving God the praise for all the victories, Saul is looking at David as if he was an enemy and trying to destroy him because Saul is envious. And yet David continues to behave himself wisely. This, this child, this son of Saul continues to behave himself wisely in all of his ways and as a result, the Lord is with him. Verse 17, And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter Mirab, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me, and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, and look at this, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. And so here, Saul wildly sets up an opportunity whereby David would fall by the sword, but not his own. He's going to try to get rid of this guy, but not have his own hand covered in blood. In verse 22 it continues and says, And Saul commanded his servant, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servant spake those words in the ear of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David. And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought it to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And so instead of taking a dowry, Saul arranges that, hey, I'll give you my daughter, which was usually exchanged in some sort of money. Nowadays, I think the tradition is that the husband would pay for the wedding. It's the dowry exchange. In that traditional sense, he would give, basically purchase the wife, and then that would become the exchange that was made. He said, don't give me no dowry. Give me, uh, give me the foreskins of the enemies in such a great number, in fact, that it seemed completely impossible. He was going to have to slay 
men upon men upon men upon men and destroy these Philistines in order to get what was deemed acceptable as a dowry. Saul did this wildly in order to destroy him. In verse 28 it says, Saul saw and knew that David, or knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet more afraid of David because he succeeded in this, right? And Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. So with all this going on, and we saw it came... First Saul invites him in. Then Saul begins to be jealous because of the song that was sang. Then Saul sets up, because of his great fear, a way to destroy him after his own javelin couldn't finish the job. And David overcomes the great task that Saul set before him, succeeds, he gets the wife, and now Saul is even more afraid of David, and David continues to just be more and more righteous, behaving himself more and more wisely toward his father-in-law, and he's just astonished by this. Saul doesn't know what to do. Now we see here David as the son, he's completely obedient to his father, right? He's going out wherever he wants him to go. And he's fighting the battles wherever he wants him to fight. He's behaving very wisely in this situation. So David is getting instruction from his father, and you don't see any indication of questioning it, right? You don't see any indication of, of, of being rebellious or not, not getting behind the task whatsoever. Even when it seems to be impossible, how can you ask for such a thing as a dowry? A hundred dead Philistines presented before me? How can this be? It would be easy for David to say, you already threw a javelin at me. You've already, you've already made yourself into my enemy. You, you, you've wronged me, Father. How, why would I do this for you? But said David continually behaves himself wisely. And his wise acts, I believe, the one that is just jumping out of the page in verse 18 is the fact that he is doing exactly what his father says every time in obedience his authority over him despite the fact his authority had made himself his enemy look at verse 29 Saul became David's enemy continual dad became son's enemy continually was trying to kill him was trying to set him to be killed despite all those things the son David remained obedient to the authority that he was placed under that is the wisest thing you see David doing in the context of these scriptures and because of the great obedience that David was showing Saul feared and he hated David yet David in his response more and more and more. And I love that verse 30. I put that up on my computer at work. David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. Do you know what that means? He's behaving himself so wisely than anybody, so that he has so much responsibilities. Man, this job's got to get done. No one can do this. David can. This job needs to be done. That's a suicide mission. David can do it. No one can ever appease this scenario. David can do it. His name, his responsibility, his mark was placed behind so many things because he was behaving himself wisely, more wisely than all the servants of Saul. And how did he do that? He did it by obedience to his father. 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 1, it says, And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all the servants that they should kill David. So Saul continues in his rage toward his son-in-law. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will commune with my father of thee. And what I see, that will I tell thee. And Jonathan spake good of David. David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against thy servant against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee word very good. Again, a testimony coming from the other brother. And how often do other brothers testify good of their siblings? Look, look, Dad, David hasn't sinned against thee. He continues to not sin against thee. He's very good towards you. Why are you sinning against him? Why are you wronging him? Jonathan is just pleading for his brother in this case. 
Verse 5 says, For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swear as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as at the time past. And so we see, despite the fact that they're made great enemies, there was this little reprieve of peace. And this is what happens whenever you're in a scenario, like David was, where father and son aren't getting along. They can still get along for a moment of time. But regardless of whether dad is throwing javelins at the son's head, or he's saying, all right, come in, sup with me, and be a part of me. Regardless, the wisdom of the son is all in the obedience to his authority, to his parent at this time. So for a while, this was restored and as before David enters into the presence of Saul and he obeys and he plays as he did before verse 8 continues and it says and there was war against and David went out and fought with the Philistines just like he always had right in obedience unto his king and to his father and slew them with a great slaughter and they fled from him and the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul and he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David, even unto the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence. And he smote the javelin to the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. And what is happening here is, even though they had that moment of peace, Saul is just right back into it. That spirit comes upon him, that, 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 that jealous, that envious spirit, that evil spirit of hatred towards his son-in-law comes upon him. He throws the javelin again. He's sending messengers to destroy him. And David is... All he's doing is showing his obedience to his father. And his father is just being, for lack of a better term, rotten to him. Just being wicked toward him. Just being sinful toward him. And one thing that we need to learn about this scenario from David's perspective, children can grab something now. Children, young adults, none of you in this room have moms and dads that throw javelins at your hand, do you? Do you have moms and dads that are sending people your way to kill you, to destroy you? Are they throwing spears at you? Are they running you around? Are they trying to get people to, to hurt you, to harm you? Are they, are they lying about you? No, none of us are in this scenario. Most of us have parents that seek our good, our welfare. They're trying to be a blessing to you in their lives. They're trying to encourage you and trying to see the best for you and trying to see what you can do and accomplish in your life. If they just give you the right structure and the right... They're trying to love you. They're trying to nurture and care for you. They're not trying to destroy you. And yet we have in this room children that are rebellious to their parents. David, despite having javelins thrown at his very head, despite having his dad trying to have enemies come and destroy him, setting him up in the most harsh scenarios where he could fall by the sword as a hundred Philistines come upon them. David, throughout all of that, having a wicked dad, was a blessing to his father and did exactly what his father commanded him. He was obedient. The Bible says he behaved himself wisely. The wisest thing you can do, children, is obey your parents, whether they're great to you or rotten to you. That's what the Bible is teaching here. Children, young adults, you don't have these parents throwing stuff at you and hurting you, and yet there's rebellion even in this room. Keep your finger there in 1 Samuel chapter 19. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. In the New Testament. Galatians is right after 1 and 2 Corinthians. And while you turn there, I'm going to read for you Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. Where the Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Okay? And some of us who are a little bit older might be saying to ourselves, well, I'm not a child, so this doesn't qualify for me. I don't have to obey my parents in the Lord. It's not right. I'm not a child. But I had you turn to Galatians in chapter 4 and verse 1, just so we can be clear that the Bible is talking specifically about those 
that have not learned up enough to where there are adults that can fend for themselves. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. What's that talking about? The heir is the one that is next in line. If you are a child under your parents, you are the heir of whatever your parent leads for you. The Bible records here that you differeth nothing from a servant. In other words, your parents are the masters and you are the servant. That is what the Bible records here. So children, obey your parents in the Lord. If you're a little bit older, if you're still under their authority, if you're under their household, if you are the heir, you differeth nothing from a servant. Go back to Ephesians there in verse 6, chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6. And I already read for you, children, obey your parents in the Lord. You try to say, oh, I'm not a child. I'm grown. I'm, I'm almost an adult. I am an adult, whatsoever it may be. The Bible says of servants, and we just said that the heir differeth nothing from a servant. In other words, if you're still under your parents' rules, under your parents' authority, under your parents' structure, if they're still putting a roof over your head, if they're still putting clothes on your back, if they're still giving you food and sustenance, taking you to all the things that you want to do, and doing all the things they can for you, you are a servant and under them. And, and uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5 says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and watch this, in singleness of heart as unto Christ. What this is indicating is that the picture of your obedience to your masters, children, that's your parents, young adults, you live under parents' roof, same thing, your obedience unto them is a reflection of your heart as unto Christ. If you're not obeying your parents in the Lord now, you are showing how you obey Christ now. It's the exact same thing. And so the Bible is plain. You need to be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. And this Bible continues and says in verse 6, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, Doing the will of God from the heart. So that means it's not with eye service. In other words, it's not just when parents are watching. It's not just when the parents' eyes are upon you, when other people's eyes are upon you. You're not just doing your service when someone is watching, but as a servant of Christ, and Christ knoweth all and seeth all, and there's nothing that escapes his sight, you need to do to your parents according to the will of God from your heart. And verse 7 it says, with good will, doing service as to the Lord, not unto men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. All this is giving us a picture of if you're under an authority, how you ought to behave. Children, you're under your parents' authority. You're not getting away with it. You're still living under mom and dad's roof. You are under their authority. You're not getting away with it. And the picture is this. You need to obey them as if you are obeying Christ. And if you're not obeying mom and dad, then you are not obeying Christ. And the Bible extends that further to say in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, as unto the good and gentle, so unto the forward. Meaning, in spite of how your parents treat you back, you need to have the utmost obedience, the utmost respect, the utmost servitude to them because you are serving Christ. And when you serve Christ, you're going to take knocks in this life. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get pushed around. Life is hard. And your parents are not as hard on you, I guarantee it, as the world out there will be. And so when you are here under your parents' Per, or your parents' authority, you are learning little life lessons about how to serve and be obedient and be in a structure that is given you, dictated from above down, and you are learning obedience through those things, and you're supposed to do it in the will of God according to what He commands, according to what He desires 
from the heart in singleness of heart. And that's the only way as a young child you are going to be blessed. And that's the promise that's made here in verse 8. Whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Whether you're a slave and un, without mercy, or whether you are free and, at, 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 and able to run and roam. Okay? Regardless of the scenario that you have at home, you need to, with good will, do that service as to the Lord and not unto men. Obedience, then, does not depend on on who is above you giving the instructions. Does that make sense? And if you learn that, then when God says, who is always benevolent, who is always good, who is always giving commands that are right and that are just and that are fair and that are equal, then obeying him, if you had that scenario where your dad was throwing a javelin at your head, which none of you do, obeying God is easy. Your structure at home is simply a picture of the structure that you will someday face out in the real world. And if you can't make it now, it's no wonder why so many children these days are not making it as they grow up and go out and live their own lives. Obedience is done because God said so. It's not like I just get to pick and choose when to obey. God says it, you must do it. Luke chapter 8. What does God say here? He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Luke chapter 8, the Bible records, Luke chapter 8, verse 22. Remember I just said, God said it, our only job is to simply obey it and do it. Okay? Luke chapter 8, in verse 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water, and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and, and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, be afraid, wondered one to another, What? manner of man is this for he commandeth even the winds and water and they obeyed him what manner of men is our lord that he can command the wind rebuke the wind and the water and say peace be still and what does it do it obeys that's what the bible records it simply obeys the water didn't ask questions the water didn't come up with excuse the water didn't say, well, maybe this is a better idea. The water just did what the Lord said. The Lord rebuked and said, peace, be still. Still, instantly. And verse 26 continues and said, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And I love this because that picture that they just saw of the wind obeying when they rebuked is about to get played out again in this same context. Verse 27, And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High? I beseech thee, tor me not, torment me not. For he had it commanded, the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because we are many. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out to the deep. And it continues on. And what you're seeing here is Jesus coming to a place where there is a man who is tormented with devils. The Bible says legion, for we are many. Thousands of devils are in this man. But if you don't look at this in context carefully, you miss something. And I often miss this until it was pointed out to me. The Bible gives you in verse 29, look at that, you got parentheses over that whole statement. So in verse 28 it says, The devils, when he saw Jesus, cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice, this is what the devil said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? Okay? If you look down in verse 29, the statement is made, 
For he had, and this is a past tense thing, he had, and this is response to the statement that was just made, he had commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the man. So what happened here? He commanded the unclean spirits to come out, in verse 29, which happened before. Then in verse 28, the devils, known as legion, said, What have I to do with thee? What business is this of yours, they said to the Lord. And do you know what his response is? Who do you think you are? He said, Jesus commanded, God said, Come out of the man. Come out of the man. And they said, what have I to do with thee? What business is this of yours? And his response, what is thy name? Who do you think you are? Ask yourself, when you disobey parents, when God gave you the command to obey your parents, he probably says the same thing to you. Who do you think you are? What's your name? Your name's not Jesus. Your name's not God. Your name's not Lord. Who do you think you are? He commanded these unclean spirits to come out. And you know what devils do? Devils say, no, no, this is none of your business. Don't worry about it. Hey, instead of just commanding us to come out, why don't you send us into swine? They got all these excuses is what this legion of devils does. They got a whole bunch of reasons as to why they're not going to obey the clear command of God. Who do you think you are? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, is the clear command that comes unto us. And you know what we do? Just like a bunch of devils. No, 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 we don't have to believe that command. My parents are mean to me. My parents are bad to me. They don't let me do what I want to do. They're always trying to make up rules for me. I don't like this. This isn't good. Instead of doing that, what if I do something like this? Just like a bunch of gathering devils caught into a man. They come up with excuses as children. Who do you think you are? God commands and you question. You're acting like a bunch of devils when you do that. You realize that? It's the Bible shows. And yet the wind, the waves, you would think it would be much harder to get an ocean and a storm to obey, right? You'd think it would be a much more challenging thing to stop winds. And yet when God says, peace be still, it happens. And then when our parents say, peace be still, we're going to fuss. We're going to fight. We're going to make some more loud noise. We're going to get on. We're going to carry on. We're going to fight. We're going to kick back. The winds are more obedient. Some of the children in here. Some of the young men in here. The Bible says to be subject unto your parents. The Bible says to obey your parents. And I believe that this is until you are grown up enough to do what the Bible says, and that's leave father and mother and cleave unto your wife, and therefore you become one flesh. But think about this, okay? The Bible teaches that the best thing that a kid can do, okay, and this is this is foreign to the world that we live in. The best thing that a kid can do is to submit themselves under the authority of their parents until they reach a point of maturity where they find the one that they want to spend their life with. They marry them, they leave father and mother, they cleave to this wife, and that becomes their new domain of authority that they live in. But think about this. If you're gonna disobey your parents now young ladies, how in the world are you going to follow a husband when he's leading you? And young men, if you are not going to be in the proper authority structure that you're under now and learn to obey, how are you going to take on a young lady as a wife and expect her to fall under your authority and obey you? The Bible teaches this principle called you reap what you sow. So young man, if you're going to be disobedient, kick back against your parents all the time, always question them, always fight against them, always, always just have some better way, some better idea. You know what you're going to get for a wife if you ever find one? A wife that is constantly kicking against you, arguing with you, fighting with you, fussing with you, questioning your authority. And the ladies, if you don't learn to submit under your parents, how in the world are you going to submit properly and decently according to the Bible under your husband one day, if you ever find one? You're learning how to live in this world when you put yourself in the proper structure under your family, under your parents, under the authorities that you have. If you don't learn now, you won't be able to apply what you've learned later. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19. 
Back in 1 Samuel chapter 19, we just passed over the idea of obeying your parents in the Lord. And I think we see very clearly that this is God's command for you. If you're not obeying your parents in the Lord, you are not doing what is right. You are rebelling against God. You're acting like the devil. 1 Samuel chapter 19 and in verse 12. So you all have the scenario where your parents love you, they care for you, they admonish you, they're encouraging you, they're trying to get you to do what is right. We know that David was in a different scenario here. So look what happens in verse 12. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And in verse 18 it says, So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul, right, that's his father, had done to him. And he said, and he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. So what had happened here is that with the death threats, with the anger, with the rage, with the struggle that was going on at home, David reached a breaking point to where he decided, based on you know, the provoking of his wife, where she said, if you save not your life tonight, tomorrow you shall be slain. Saul's after you. Saul's men are after you. You know, dad was trying to kill the boy. Dad was trying to kill the lad. And it came to a point where the wife says it's time to go. And so kind of in a little bit of a type, in a picture, there is the leave and cleave happening. You see that? You see how the wife urged the husband to go, and then the husband David went out from under the authority that Saul had him under because of the threats, because of the danger. David, we can all appreciate the fact, needed to flee. And David isn't just like a little boy here. David's a full-grown man. He was a great leader. He was esteemed as, as like a general in Saul's army. He was a great, beefy, strong man's man, right? But David needed to flee so then what had happened here is obedience unto Saul when he left and clave unto his wife, although she didn't go with him. When he left from under the obedience of Saul, it went from obey, children obey your parents unto the Lord, to what it says next, and that is honor your father and mother. And Ephesians chapter 6 continues on, and I was supposed to read that, but it says here, children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. You can write this down or go there quickly. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long in the earth. Okay? So obedience to Saul had transferred to honor thy father. And it says here that that's the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long in the earth. And it's interesting because that was the same type of promise that was given to obeying your parents, to submitting to those as servants that have the rule over you. Long life, prosperity, all those things come with doing what is right in these scenarios, okay? So again, what had happened was because Saul had that bad news parent, that bad guy parent, and the same, I guess, would apply when you leave and cleave with your wife. When you transfer out of the authority of your parents, you are now responsible to honor your parents. You don't obey your parents because the Bible teaches leave and cleave. And so too often in-laws get involved in scenarios in married couples. But once the son, once the daughter has left as a married couple, the parents don't have authority over them as far as, hey, do this, do that, buy this house, sell this, buy this car, you have to do everything my way. No. But the kids still have, the children still have the responsibility upward in the authority chain to honor. 1 Samuel chapter 23. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 23. We see David just transferred out again. He, he fled from Saul. He is now out on his own. He should have went with his wife, but he didn't. He's out on his own. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 7. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town and hath gates and bars. And Saul called for the people together to war, to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief. <coughs> 
So what you're seeing here, and I'm just going to give you a bunch of steps for what I believe David's story outlines in regard to honoring parents. Remember, David is not under his dad anymore. David's out on his own doing his own thing. But it seems like his dad is still very much involved in his business, doesn't it? David comes and he gets to a place that is shut in and Saul again sends warriors to close him in and to try to destroy him. The first thing that we see there in 1 Samuel 23 and in verse 11, the Bible says, <clears throat> oh, verse 10, And David said, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah. So in verse 9, David knew that Saul practiced mischief. And in verse 10, what is the first thing that David is doing to honor Saul? He's praying. Okay, in verse 10, you see that? And David said, O Lord. So the first thing David does when he recognizes that Saul's not going to give up. Saul's not just going to let him go away and, and live in a cave and have his own house and have his own domain. Here comes his father Saul, and he's going to impose himself in the situation. The first thing David does to honor Saul is that he prayed. He prayed unto God, and look how it continues in 9b. The Bible says, And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. And David said, in verse 10, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into the hand? And will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men to the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. The next thing that he did, first David prayed. The next thing that he did was that he avoided conflict. That's what it says in verse 2. He found that Saul was going to come and try to kill him. He found through prayer that the men were going to turn him over. And so he tries to avoid the conflict by carrying on and getting out of there. If you continue down in verse 14, it says, And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in the mountains of the wilderness of Ziph. Okay, so that's what David did when he found out that this was happening. He found out he was closed in. He found out he couldn't get away from the attacks of his father. He prayed, and then he avoided the conflict. He simply ran away, and he went again into the wilderness, into the strongholds. And he remained there doing the honorable thing highly respectable thing, doing the right thing by just keeping a distance. And that's how you can honor parents that are trying to kill you. Once you've moved out, once you've, you're doing your own thing, once, once you, you've left father and mother, ideally, and gotten married, or you've just moved out, now you're going to do your own thing. Not ideal. But once you've left the authority structure, your honor comes as praying for your parents. And if they're being rotten to you, just avoid the conflict and go some other place as their attacks come. 1 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 1 continues, and it says, And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. He continues, Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men of all Israel, and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet, and David his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day which the Lord said to thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it seemeth good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterwards David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said to the men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So we just said the first thing you need to do for parents that are being wrong towards you to honor them is pray for them and avoid conflict. Pray for them and avoid conflict. And what happened here is that David was given the opportunity by divine providence to stand before Saul and he could have just killed him. But all he did was cut his skirt. That may seem strange, but a skirt's just a long garment. So this would be considered the skirt of my garment, right? So it's just a longer part of my coat that goes past my waist. 
right? So that's the skirt of the garment. So what happened was that Saul was sleeping, Saul was resting. David could have ended all of the strife. He could have ended all of the struggle. He could have just put this whole thing to rest, put it to bed. I'm sick of fighting. I'm sick of my father getting in my business. I'm sick of my father fighting me. And he could have just thrust him through with the blade or had one of his men do that. Instead, he just cut off a little square of his garment there and took it with him. Okay? But even in that, even in that, the Bible says that David's heart smote him. God forbid that I should touch the Lord's anointed. Even in that act of removing his clothes, I have done something harmful to him. I have done detriment to him. And God commanded that I do nothing against the Lord's anointed. So the next point that I want to bring to your attention is do no malicious harm. That's how you have honor for your parents. That's how you honor for your authorities. You do no malicious harm unto them. Even if we think that we could have destroyed them, but we just cut the garment and that was much better, the reality is, is that David's heart smote him. He was rebuked by his own conscience and he realized, hey, I shouldn't have even done that to cut the hem of his garment. The Bible continues and on to the next point about how we honor our parents. 1 Samuel 24 and in verse 9, it says, and David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen, and that the Lord hath delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in mine hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe, and killed thee not. Know thou, and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand. And I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. And so Saul had in his mind that David was constantly trying to hurt and harm, and he was an enemy of him. And David proved by the fact that he could have killed him, but only took a part of his skirt. He proved, even though that even seemed wrong in his heart, that he would never have hurt Saul, even if he was given the chance. And in verse 12 it says, The Lord judge between me and thee. And the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. And this verse, and others like it, has just rang in my heart anytime I'm in persecution, anytime people have wronged me or hurt me. The Lord judge between me and thee. The Lord knows my heart. The Lord knows your heart. I'm not going to get involved in this scenario. I'm not going to get involved in this fight. God be the judge. Let God be the judge. And that's the next point. We said pray. That's how you show honor. Avoid conflict. That's how you honor your parents. Do no malicious harm and let God be the judge. Verse 13, remain humble. It says, as saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see, and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. Doesn't David's words just resonate with humility? He's saying, look, I didn't try to hurt you. I'm not trying to harm you. I'm trying to do you right. God is my judge. God is my witness. You're coming after a flea. I'm a nobody, Saul. I'm a nobody, Father. Why are you trying to destroy me? I'm not trying to hurt you. And he says, hey, God is the judge. Let God judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of thine hand. He is not coming at Saul with this holier-than-thou attitude, with this idea like he is, he is so great and why would you come at me and I'm, and I'm a good person and that's what we tend to do if we have parents that are not into the fact that we're serving God and we're trying to lead our families aright, we're trying to do those things. If we, have fair, if we have parents that are hostile towards that, we tend to take on this holier-than-thou attitude. Well, we don't celebrate Christmas because now we're Christians. Or we don't celebrate Halloween. That's a better one. We do Christmas. We don't do Halloween because now we're Christians. We put on this holier-than-thou attitude before our parents. That doesn't show them honor. That's not giving honor to our parents. What we need to do is be humble in all scenarios and all dealings with them and just say, hey, God be the judge between you and me. I have a sincere heart, and I don't know what's in your heart, but God knows. The next chapter of the Bible continues, and it says that Samuel died there. Um, this was, I believe, the last spiritual hope for Saul. At this time, Samuel was still talking with Saul and speaking with Saul and prophesying unto Saul. But at this chapter, at this point, Samuel died. Those are the first three words in chapter 25. And Samuel died. And there's a great big lamentation over this fact. This was the last opportunity that the father, that Samuel, had to 
hear the word of God, to do right. And at the end of that chapter, the Bible says in verse 44, it says, Saul had given Michal his daughter, David's wife, to Philatai, the son of La La Laish, which was in Galem. And so the Bible is recording that even, it just keeps getting worse and worse. He's even given away David's wife, his, his daughter-in-law. He's even basically cut off any connection that he's even his son. He's not even treating him like a son at this point. He's, he's just like, you know, you're not even married to my, my daughter anymore. This is how bad the relationship has gotten between son-in-law and father. But David, as he always does, is going to continue to first obey behaving wisely. Now he's going to submit himself in the proper order, and that is honoring his father-in-law, honoring his father, despite everything that's going on. You can still honor your parents. Chapter 26, again, Saul corners David in a cave. I'm just going to blaze over this. And the same opportunity is given. The Bible says that as a deep sleep of the Lord fell upon him and upon his servants. And again, he could have been destroyed. But again, David does what is right in order to honor him. He just leaves it alone. 1 Samuel 26, and in verse 11, it says, The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take now the spear that is at his bolster, the cruise of water, and let us go. And David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got him away. And no man saw it, nor knew it, neither awaked, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. And the next thing that I want to point out in regard to honoring your parents is to simply trust and obey God in all these scenarios, okay? Notice how the, the transfer has been taken, where now David isn't obeying Saul, he isn't doing what Saul says, he's not submitted under Saul, he's grown up, he's, he's left and he's cleaving to what should have been his wife, but now he's out on his own doing his own thing. And now in the area of honoring his parents, he's not trusting and obeying his father, he's trusting and obeying the Lord. And he found another scenario where a deep sleep from God had come upon these soldiers and he was able to walk into this scenario, come out unscathed. If you continue in uh, 26 and verse 17, the Bible says, And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the lord. And it continues on. And their back and forth here is one of peace. And again, in verse 21, Saul comes out and he says, I have sinned, return my son David. And so Saul again is going to have this great time of repentance seemingly. But what I grasp from that portion of the scripture, and you can read it over again, is that, is that in order to honor your parents, you need to have some interaction, but limited. There's a very limited interaction. You see, the, the opportunity that came, he could have destroyed Saul, but instead he did it, and now they're conversing at a distance. And even get, extending the olive branch where they could come back, come return my son, I'll do thee no harm, is all the promises that he's making. But, but they're, they're obviously... They're obviously, you know, just lies. Again, Saul's just going to make these things up. But what we need to find here is that we need to be without blame. We can have some, like if we had the parent that hypothetically was trying to kill us, trying to throw that javelin and destroy us, we can have some contact. And it is respectful, and it is honoring to them to have interaction with them, to let them see the grandchildren, whatever. But don't let it be frequent, don't let it be often, and let it always be in control of yourself. You need to have and then maintain those safeguards. And that's what the next point is, maintain cautious. First Samuel chapter 27, verse 1, it says, And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. So it had become abundantly clear at this at this point, that David is not going to get through to Saul. Saul is not going to find repentance. They are not going to repair this relationship. So he's cautious. He's guarding his children. He's guarding his heart. He's guarding himself from this because he knows that it's just going to end in his own death if he continues to pursue this relationship. And all this came from the fact that David recognized a few things. You can find them in 1 Samuel 28, and verse 3 through 6. That one, God was not speaking to Samuel anymore. The prophet had passed away. The prophet was no more in his life. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 3, it says, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of 
the land. But if you continue, it says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And the next one says, And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not. So verse 7 says, Saul said to his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit that I may go unto her and acquire for her. So the next thing that you see that makes it abundantly clear that when you're honoring parents who are just wicked and ungodly and affront to everything godly you're trying to do in your life, you need to recognize, first and foremost, when God is not speaking to them, when they're consulting with familiar spirits or when they're doing ungodly practices and going after wrong religions and, and seeking wrong wrong ways of, of being guided and being led. Basically, Saul was here following after devils. And the next thing that you'll often see when you know it's just, it's just a time where you just need to step back and just get out of this scenario is in verse 8, Saul disguised himself. So you'll find your family often being fake, being phony, putting on disguises, trying to get their own way through coercion or through subtlety. That anger is always there. That deceit is always there. The violence is always there. The truth breaking is always there. But I think at this point, David would have realized and saw that he had reached a point where there's no return. The relationship's not going to be fixed. So he fled. So he went away. So he met with him one more time. But the next time that he saw him, it was too late. Saul was ended up dead. So God had finally taken control of this narrative. And this is what happens very often in the area of having honor for your parents. We talked about obedience. When you're a children, you obey your parents and the Lord. But when you get grown up, sometimes people have parents that are just not interested in the Christian life that their children are living. And some of us have experienced the same thing. But we need to still honor them. How do we honor them? We pray for them. We avoid conflict. We do no malicious harm. We let God be the judge. We remain humble. We trust and obey God. We have some very limited interaction. We remain cautious in all these scenarios. And ultimately, in the end, we just, we just bury them with dignity. Because this is what happened. Saul was killed. He fell upon his own sword. He died. The men went and gathered him and put him in the grave properly instead of letting him be a show unto the Philistines. So this is ultimately the nine steps to, I believe, according to the, the, the Bible that I've just read here, to honor bad news parents, honor heathen-type parents, parents that are trying to be an affront to you. It was brought up when I originally saw this post where there, someone said, you know, you know, honor your parents in the Lord. And then they said, but if they're X, Y, and Z, you don't have to honor them anymore. And, 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 and when you say a statement like honor your parents, there are no conditions. There are absolutely no conditions to the command, honor your parents. It goes right back to what we talked about with children. Were there, were there conditions to children obey your parents in the Lord? No, absolutely there were not. And same thing, there is no conditions to honoring your parents. But we can see how you can honor parents, even the worst kinds of parents, even parents that are trying to kill you, literally destroy you. You can do these things and still honor them, yet still keep a distance, even the worst of parents, unto the end. And that was the end that happened for Saul, was that he died, and then they just honorably put him in the grave and buried him. And then the problems were over as far as dealing with the parents whom they had to honor. And this is how I believe Christians have to honor parents. Children, obey your parents. That's the start until you're ready to move out. Obey, obey, obey. That's how you live the Christian life as a child. Obey your parents, obey your parents, obey your parents. Be obedient unto your parents. And when you grow up, when you're old enough, when you move out, right, honor them. Pray for them. Avoid conflict. Do no malicious harm. Let God be the judge. Remain humble. Trust and obey. Have limited interaction. Remain cautious. And, and, and then just eventually give them the proper burial. And I think that's what the Bible teaches about honoring our parents without condition. Thank you, Father.